You have found the Shanty Pants Show. Hello, it's Shanny, the least influential influencer that there ever was. With a heart full of laughter and a journey that runs deeper than the trendiest bake up pe- pel- pellet, 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 pel. You may know me from my ridiculously comedic fashion and makeup tutorials on social media, but guess what? There's so much more to the story. I was born, raised, and married in a cult. When I left the cult at 31 years old, I had no knowledge about real life or how to process what I had been through. I felt very alone. The past couple of years, I've been on an incredible journey of learning, growing, and recovering, and I'm excited to share this with you. I'll bring you stories from the Cultiverse, where many cult survivors and experts share their knowledge and experiences. Their stories are more than inspiring. They're a roadmap to self-discovery and resilience. So get ready for a podcast that's part comedy, part wisdom, and a whole lot of heart. If you feel alone in your journey, my hope is that that will change once you hear these stories. Welcome to the Shanty Pants Show. I am so excited today to have Rebecca here with me, and I really appreciate you coming and being on the Shady Pants Show. I've been very excited to talk to you and get to know your story a little more. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for the audience and just tell us who you are. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I've been excited too. Um, yeah. So my name is Rebecca Drumsta, and kind of my little one-liner thing is four different religious cults impacted the foundation of my life. So my childhood started as this kind of, they're all linked this chain link of all these different religious cults and to the outside world, we look like a normal family, um, just in normal church type settings, just a conservative Christian family, but then not everything that glitters is golden, is it? So, um, so that's kind of my background. Now though, I'm married, I'm a mom, um, I am in leadership in an international nonprofit. And then I also do work with religious trauma. I do consulting and coaching and I write and I blog and I do all the things. And that led me into this work of, I know what it's like to be a new mom and scared out of your mind with what you believe, because you start realizing I, I, I can't raise my kid this same way but I don't know what's right. I don't know who I can trust. I don't know what to believe. I don't know who I am anymore. And so I, I kind of got into the religious trauma space because I never wanted there to be another mom who felt like me and felt like she was the only one and she didn't know what to do. And so that's really that and the birth of my daughter is what that was the catalyst that really threw me into understanding and doing this work. That's awesome. And it's so interesting because I, that was kind of having my first uh, child. Our kids are adopted, but when we got him and started raising him when we were still in our cult, that was one of the main things that was getting me on the exit because I kept thinking like when, when he was uh three, I think, yeah, three, two or three when we removed ourselves. And um, I just kept thinking like, as he gets older, I like, I have to lie to him. I, cause I don't believe these things. And that started feeling so icky to me to just like, oh, here we go again. Like just how I was raised. It was so confusing. We were, our family was always in trouble and cause we were like rebellious and, you know, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. Like I can't even imagine, you know, he's this little toddler right now, but putting him through what we, what we had to go through. So that's interesting because that was exactly my mindset around it. It was like, uh, like, how do I, I'm going to be lying to my kid. I'm going to be lying to my kid. So let's go back to what led yeah. up to this and start with like your childhood and kind of how you were raised and then kind of your movement through, like you said, multiple different groups um, until yeah. you decided you were done with all of them. Uh, my Some of my first religious memories, like being four, three, four, five years old, most of them are not positive. Mm. Um. One of the first being, I'm around five, my family had decided to leave a church. So this church had become a cult to itself because the pastor would do things such as, everyone in the church stand up. 
Now, I'm going to say something that I believe or want to have happen in this church. If you do not agree with me, you must walk out the doors right now and never come back. And no one is allowed to speak to them ever again. They are now shunned from our church. So this completely divided my own family. This divided friends. This divided all of this. And so my family eventually decided to leave that church, which again had become a cult to its own self. Um, because of the leadership, because of the style. Um, also within that denomination, I've heard the same type of thing happened. It kind of like the independent fundamental Baptist, it kind of festered and went from one church to the next. Um, but they did leave. And so I'm five years old. I'm on the church playground. Um, my family had been in leadership. And so they had to finish up some things before we left. And a little girl walks up to me and picks up sand and just throws it into my eyes. And she starts telling me that my family is going to hell that nobody's ever going to talk to us again, that we're horrible people because we're leaving this church. And so that's what I remember, like, wait a minute. So if I go to another church, I go to hell. And then also around five years old, there had been a family that had been part of a Mormon sect down in Mexico. It was a Texas, Mexico sect. And that had been founded by one man who was the father, the leader of this. And, um, one of his daughters and her husband and six children um, escaped. They left and they ended up coming to our church and they were not going back. They refused to go back. So the father was murdered as an atonement killing. And the parents were very close to my family. And again, at five years old, I go, wait a minute. So if you don't believe like I do, or again, I leave then you can be killed. Oh my gosh. And so those are my first two memories. Um, there's a few others, but those are the really big ones that impacted trusting people, feeling mm -hmm. betrayed, you know, learning, okay, I have to, I have to follow this line, you know, the party line very carefully yeah. or else really bad things will happen to me. And so those are the first two cults that impacted me greatly. Um, and then my family moved into the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church and joined Bill Gothard's organization called the IBLP. And that's where I grew up the bulk of my years. And as anybody kind of in the uber conservative homeschool space, there's so many more shoot offs. Mm -hmm. There's I mean, whether we want to talk about Vision Forum and Gwen Shamblin with the Way Down Workshop or, you know, oh, all of these others. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen, for my body <laughs> yeah. and the dishes. Thank you. So those are the bulk of my childhood, though, was within the IFB denomination and Bill Gothard, which there's shiny, happy people now that helps us understand that. Right. And then there's a new documentary called Let Us Pray. It will talk about exposing the IFB uh, and all the, the hidden it. abuses in that denomination. So, yeah, that's like the really how fast, what, three, four minute <laughs> I can explain it all. That's my background. So were you married? Were you able to marry outside of the church? Did you marry inside of the church or the group? How did that work? Yeah. Um, it's kind of a yes and no. Um, okay. So my husband, I actually met him at church. He walked in and he sat down behind me and saw this little hourglass figure, super long curly hair. He's like, yeah, I'm going to sit <laughs> over there. And so he walks and sits down. We shake hands. It's shaking hands time at church. <laughs> and I just knew this man was going to change my life, like instantly. Mm. It was that moment, not, oh my word, I'm going to marry him. He's my Prince Charming. No, it's just like, oh my goodness, this guy's going to change my life. I literally had that moment. And he was okay. Like we weren't really interested in each other because courtship was the thing we had to do. And, mm. um, but he had been discipled by a Bill Gothard family way back where he used to live when he'd become a Christian. And so because of that, because there were connections to the people mm. who made sure he believed all the right things um, in my little IFB church, then he was approved by my family. Okay. And okay. so he did not, he did not have a similar background to me at all. He had just moved to our town and was looking for a church and happened to walk in and met me and stayed. Oh, and wow. um he wouldn't have stayed otherwise but he mm. met me so yeah and then the rest is history but wow. that's kind of how i met my husband and yes it was influenced by all the things yeah but um no he has a very different background so he obviously stayed then because of you how old were you at that time 
We were married when I was 22, almost 23. Okay. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he, how long did you guys have to do your courtship situation for? How did that work? It was really work? fast. Oh, was it? Ah! It was really fast. Uh, we courted for three months, were engaged for three months, and then got married. Wow. Wow. I do not recommend this to anybody who's listening, no. but <laughs> no. that is how yeah. it went for us. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And are you still married to him today? I am. Okay. Okay. That's so by the grace of God. Yeah. Like <laughs> and I will I will tell you it has not been easy. Uh -huh. So it's almost been 20 years, not quite, but almost. And being married to someone who grew up in all these religious cults and with the mind control and the purity culture and mm -hmm. I've not been easy to be married to from that perspective. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, he has got his own sets of issues. Don't get me wrong, but it's been hard because I didn't realize how deeply, of course you don't, you know, they talk about unpacking your baggage before you get married. Well, what happens if you <laughs> think that your bags are Louis Vuitton and they're the most amazing things in the world because you've been told that your whole life, right. but this is absolute truth. And this is the best way to live. And these are the whole right things. And then you start realizing, Oh my word, this is just like the Walmart version. <laughs> yeah. This, yes. this really needs help. Right. This right. is not cool. And yeah. so you don't realize you have baggage until you're in the middle of a marriage and you have a kid and suddenly it's what do we do? There's no help. There's no resources. But we're we're drowning. And did you feel that way before you left? Or was it just did it um, get hard after when you started going through all of that? Because we did the same thing. I didn't. And I did. So I lived in India for a while. Okay. And while I was there, I saw Christianity being done very differently. Mm. They had drums in their music. They danced. People would walk barefoot miles to go to church. They mm. would bring a chicken or bring a bag of rice that they could have eaten for them, their family, but to give to God. People would get baptized in India. And that was the ultimate sign that you were changing your faith. And if yeah. you were Muslim in the community where I was, if you were baptized as a Christian, especially if you were a woman, your family might kill you. And I met mm. a woman who that happened to. Wow. And then her child came to live at the orphanage where I was. And so I saw a completely different way of being a Christian. And I was young. I was 18 and 19 at that time. And so I began having questions. Why are they so like, why are drums okay for them? And we say that they're evil and satanic. Why, did, you know, all of these things didn't add up. And I was the same person in that country. But even some of the things that I believed were considered wrong there. And so that's where I started having these questions. But then you come home and it's like, oh, no, 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 no. They're just uneducated people. Oh, no, 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 no. Our version of Christianity is right. They just don't, haven't been taught that yet. So getting married, you know, moving out about a year after we were married, my husband was like, we're leaving this church, by the way. Bye. And as a good, submissive, obedient wife, I followed him. And that's how we got out of that church. And he would then tell me, I only stayed for you. <laughs> oh, so, my gosh. Um, so he was only so really I, in it for about a year and a half then. In that church, yes. Oh. So again, he'd been discipled by the Gothard people when he was younger, but then he was only there. But he knew quickly that something was off. He didn't know how to, how to say what it was. He just knew something was off, but he met me and he knew that, yeah, this is the person I'm supposed to spend my life with. And so, oh, uh, well, I'm so glad, like, I love that you said it, this, it hasn't been easy because no. I feel like so many people, so my husband was raised the exact same way I was. We were okay. born into our group cult and so we didn't have, um, we both have the same baggage or similar baggage, you know, going out yeah. of it. But it, it has not been easy. And we're at, I think, 23. We've been married 23 years now. And it has been a rough road. And I think yeah. people, and I'm sure you get this with you, with helping people that are the exiting, you know, or from spiritual mm -hmm. abuse or religious abuse. So I'm sure you see it a lot. But it is, you know, you get out and you think, okay, well, for us that had lived in it our whole lives, 
it was truly like, what do we do? We didn't really know how to make our own decisions. Mm -hmm. Like you had mentioned, that stood out to me. Everyone else is wrong. All the other churches are wrong. All the other Christians are wrong because they don't know our way yet. And so it was kind of, you know, at the time I never would think, oh, it's scary. But looking back, I'm like, it was scary. We had no friends. We were all of a sudden cut off from, you know, so much family drama. Luckily, my family did get out at the same time as well um, or around the same time. So, so we had that at least. But really, it was like very weird because everyone else was wrong, you know. And so it was trying to figure yeah. that out of like, okay, wait, they said that they're Christians, they're really nice people, but we're not supposed to associate with them. Mm -hmm. And it, so it was very, very weird to so get What helped that. you guys in the end? Where did you find help? So like, not until the last couple of years, like real help. But um, initially, my husband met someone at his new, he got a new job. And he met this guy who lived like really close to us and they were Christians. And so I forget how the first time happened, but we like got together with them. And it was truly so weird because we were supposed to associate with other people like ever. It was always yeah. our, our cult. That's the world. <laughs> it's the world. Your world is this little group. And so we, yeah, the world, the world world is bad. They're evil. They're uh, going to take you straight to hell. They're going to so destroy bad. your family. Yeah. So bad. So bad. So it was very weird, but we like met with them and I'm like, oh, these are very nice people. And we became really good friends with them. And so they were a big impact in that and us kind of realizing, okay, wait, that's okay. They go to whatever church and they're, it doesn't even matter. Like, and then yeah. a lot of our age group had exited at the same time as us or around the same time. So we okay. kind of started connecting back with some of the people that also had left, um, and that helped because we had some core relationships that were able to move forward yeah, and a lot yeah. weren't, you know, it's just, it is what it is. There's so much trauma involved with it all that I think it was hard for some people to reconnect, but well, that, broken that relationships, helped. Yeah. That's yeah, yes. one of the big things, whether it's family or friends we grew up yeah. with, when you do choose to leave, you don't know, you may be on your own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, and it just causes so much. Like we always were taught, um, you know, that we shouldn't have division and unity. We should all be united and no division. So they would use the word division as like, you're not following the rules, so you're causing division. And yet mm -hmm. the division that they put on the families and the friendships yeah. and these lives was absolutely off I mean it's still it's still going so it's absolutely yeah. terrible the division that it's caused I've talked to people that would love to be on the podcast from my group but they can't because their daughter's still in and they're like if she finds out I speak out about this her husband won't let yeah. her talk to me and we barely can talk as it is or whatever and it's like ah it. oh, yeah I'm sure you see that all the time and it's well it's that's why I didn't use my full name um when I started blogging I couldn't because I was scared. I had already lost so many people. I was already feeling like I was living this double life um, of what I really believe. And yet over here is what I was still, you know, going to the church or, you know, associating with certain people. And I was like, but I don't think like this anymore. And I would just have to keep my mouth shut. And it was one of the most courageous things at the time that I'd ever done was when I did. I put my full name on my website and not just, you know, the other name. And that felt like this huge reclaiming moment. And also I'm putting this banner in the sand. Like, this is me. This is my belief. This is what I believe, you know. And so, yeah, those relationships. And that's one of the big, whether again, it's it's your, your husband and your children or your parents and your siblings and the people you grew up with. And that network changes so drastically. And something I've noticed is that when you come from the cult mentalities, like you were saying, no division and you have to agree with this, people are not equipped to handle differences. There is no mental health education. There is no, you know, resolution, conflict resolution training. And so we're just expected to do what you're told 
follow the leaders. Um, the whole Peter Pan, following the leader, the leader. That's what we're supposed to do and no, never ask questions. So when there is someone like you or me who says, this is not right, I am leaving. I mean, I was taught to stand up, like stand alone. I don't know if you were taught, stand alone for Christ. You're going to be, you know, have to do. So I began feeling like I'm standing alone. I'm doing what you taught me to do. It's just, you don't like what I'm saying. You don't like this stand I'm taking. Yes. And so because nobody has the tools, the skills, nobody knows how to navigate it. So then you and I, we're the ones who are going to therapy, who are getting these tools, who are, you know, trying to, we don't want to lose our families. I don't, you know, but then you're left with no choice because boundaries are not respected. They, they cause abuse or they are continuing to be abusive. They are. So yeah, we get in these really awkward cycles and where we have to say, I'm, I break the cycle. It has to happen. You know, it's, it's so sad to look at, we have so many people that we know that are still, you know, a part yeah. of this cult and we mm -hmm. see videos from time to time and we see the little kids that were little when we were, you know, we, we call ourselves young marrieds was what we were. Yeah. Um, and it's like now they're leading the singing and they're doing all the things it's still having it's, their own babies and gosh yes and i'm just like yeah. just the freedom of getting out from underneath that is so powerful and it just it, for me i just get sad i'm still i still can get pretty angry at the leaders mm -hmm. who are still doing what they're doing but for me it's mostly sadness like for the people that are mm -hmm. still involved because I know what's on the other side and I know mm -hmm. that it's possible. And, and like you were talking about the s services or whatever you, you, I forget you referred to it on the inside, as far as mental health care and things like mm -hmm. that. We, we didn't, you weren't allowed to, to have any of that. And if you needed help, you went to the leader who no one yeah. wanted to do. And, and then there would be like, you know, kind of leaderish people that you could like confide in maybe Mm -hmm. but then you find out how does everyone else know about my issue all of a sudden once the betrayal too yeah yes and it is it's all different forms of betrayal and and there's so many um adults I would say not so many there's a couple growing up that I and my husband as well really looked up to and yes. you really thought these these are people you can trust and then Hardcore, straight laced. Yeah, the yeah. hardcore, they're a little bit more relaxed or whatever. And then to see how firm they're still standing in that, when you have had moments with these people that you know they do not believe, or at one point they did not yeah. believe this hardcore. And now it's like, I don't know what they're drives still in. it. You know, you're saying that, it. and I'm thinking of one family that is coming to my mind right now. And it's like, they were the ones who didn't, you know, they let their daughter dress differently. They mm -hmm. did different music. They went to movies when we weren't. And I'm like, okay, so they're not all the way in, but they're still there. Yeah. I'm just like you said. Yeah. Yes. There it's are like those people. But, you know, recovering from it, it's kind of the same way. Like, I've noticed this pattern where when you grow up in a very fundamentalist, legalist, religious background, usually the first thing we find is grace because we didn't have any grace. So then there's a lot of people, a lot of people that I still love very, very dearly who get stuck and stop right there. That's it. That's as far as they go. This is freedom. So they get all the way out and it's a lot. It's hard work. It's hard work to find grace, to embrace this new concept. And then they stop. Then the next one is gospel centered everything. Well, this must be the answer. We have a gospel-centered church, a gospel-centered family, a gospel-centered all the things. So it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And, okay, that's great. Okay, now where's the next, you know? So there's like these stages that people go through as they're getting out. But then we all tend to get stuck. Yes. And the biggest part when I knew that I'd, I'd reach, so healing is one of those words that feels kind of ambiguous. It's like, mm -hmm. what does that really mean? Like, and perhaps to everybody, it's different. Um, but for me, healing means it's a level of awareness 
about my situation and myself so that I can recognize triggers. I recognize patterns. And so healing means I can, I have enough awareness of everything that I know what's coming and how to manage myself so that I don't cause harm to myself or other people. Because what we do is we, we get on those patterns, on those cycles. And if we don't stop long enough to have that self-awareness about the situation, our past, what's going on, you know, perhaps your spouse or your children, how things are impacting them, that's how we continue keeping the harmful patterns alive. And so we have to stop to gain that personal and larger scale awareness so that we don't continue those patterns. And so for me, that's what healing looks like. And as I began to have that greater awareness of myself, my situation, what I used to believe, where I'm going, why my parents joined this anyway, you know, why all of this happens, I began to see that everyone has the freedom to believe whatever it is they want to believe. And if I truly believe in freedom of choice, freedom of thought, then I have to let the people who are still in the cult have the freedom to believe that too. But I have the freedom to say how those beliefs cause harm to me and to the people I care about. So it's this weird balancing act of if I truly believe in the freedom of mind, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, or what all the freedoms then I have to also apply that to the, to the world that I am walking away from. But it's heartbreaking because I know the hurt. I know the abuse that's happening back there. I know the control tactics that are being used and the manipulation in the, of the Bible and of spiritual practices. And, but I, I can't, you know, so it's the hand up, the hand down thing where the people that are looking for help, like I was at a time, I want to be there to grab them. But there's still days when I need help. And I need therapy and I need yeah. friends. I need, right. you know. <laughs> so. Well, and I think it's, when I think of healing too, I think it's ongoing. It will never be like, I am healed. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be, nope. you know, because life circumstances change, everything changes. And, but I like what you said with that. And I think about that as well as, you know, obviously people are still there for their reasons or whatever, mm-hmm. but what is interesting to me is too when we come from that for me when I come from that I still it's been 12 years now I still Mm -hmm. remember what it was like to be that so I still remember the judgment I was super mean to my sister for a while because her and her husband left for a while and I was super judgmental I mean we were uh, as a as a group of judgmental people like we were it uh but (laughs) I so I can but I can remember and I think you know, my family, we were always a little bit on the outskirts. And I think mentally I was always, I, I have thoughts as that I can remember as a child yeah. questioning things. And so I feel mm. like my mind, I was always a little bit on the, like, is this okay? Like, I don't know why, but that's, mm-hmm. and I think, um, but even with that, I think I still remember being right and knowing everything and accusing everyone else of being wrong and so like when you picture them they're still I'm like yeah like I know what they're thinking like I know I mean not specifically them but like I can remember being there and so you you understand like it that draw it's so heavy and um you have the families like mine and some even more that are there for generations and yeah. it's just, it's all they know. And when you really are afraid of everything else and that's all you know, that's your cozy little safe place, you know? And th- what gets to me, and I like that you that you said that at the end there, it's the abuse that is the problem still. Yes, I want people mm-hmm. to have the freedom to believe what they want, think what they want. I, I'm there with you. But it's the abusive type things actions yes. going on that are undeniably like not okay and that's where I feel like when you do well if you so take the people... so when you were saying about how it's the abuse that is back there in the world that you and I have walked away from 
that's the part that's like, ah, what do we do about it? Um, but that's where, again, as I was saying earlier, people don't have the mental health tools or training or culture. And for me, I did not know what abuse was. So the peop- the women, the girls, the children that are left behind, they don't know they're being abused. I didn't know I was being abused. I had been taught that these certain things were biblical, that they were right. And so that's one of the f- reasons why the work you're doing, that I'm doing, that other survivors are doing really matters. Because when a woman especially, or a man, chooses to something's off and they start diving in and doing a little bit of looking around on the internet, if they can find a voice that says this is what abuse looks like. If if you've been hit this way as a child, that is abuse. You've been spoken to this way by your husband, that is abuse. And so that is why it's so important for survivor voices to surface. And again, not every survivor can. There are so many different reasons. You mentioned it before. People can't come on and talk publicly because of what they will lose or they're not ready or it may actually hurt them. Not every survivor can tell their story publicly. It may cause, may re-traumatize, but the survivors who can, can, can really, there's so many layers to the people who are trying to get out, the people who are just out, um, being able to help name things of this is what abuse is. This is what it looks like. This is how It was formed in the church, the family, the group that I was in. And this is how we are now all collectively saying no. The survivors, you, me, all of it, we're all saying no, it stops with me. My voice is one of the buck stops here moments. Your voice is that moment. We're done. So. Right. Yeah. And I think that you're right. It's so, and that's where social media, um, podcasts, I mean, there's so many yeah. things that can make such an impact now. And I know for me, a couple of years ago, I started listening to podcasts and this whole world, you know, opened up to me mm. and it truly was like free therapy in a, in several different parts of my life that I needed help in. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And just hearing other people's stories, like what we're doing right here, was so impactful for me to realize like, oh, oh, that's really similar to what I went through. How crazy. Okay. Wow. I'm not the only one. And yeah. and I do think it's so valuable because I look back 12 years ago when we got out, there mm-hmm. was nothing to look up no. that I could find or if I had the means to It was to about 15 for me and there was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, so, so that I think is, you're right. If people keep speaking out, then hopefully that's where, like you said, they don't know it's abuse. When you're in it, you don't understand it's abuse. And I've done a lot. I remember that moment again, still being a young mom, a couple month old baby. And my house was very, very creamy beige colored at the time, creamy carpet, creamy walls, creamy everything. And I remember sitting on my cream colored carpet next to my cream colored wall and I start crying. I just sit down on the stairs because that moment of this was a cult hit me. And I also remember the wave, not on my cream colored stairs, but of I was abused. And so I know what those moments feel like. And they are, for me, it was life changing. Because that's when my mind and my heart were suddenly open to accepting new thoughts. Because this doesn't wasn't just odd. This wasn't just a little bit controlling and lots of rules. This was an abusive, controlling, manipulative environment that has caused harm. And so whenever I have a client or sit down with a friend or, you know, someone, and they have that moment of realization of either this was a cult where I was abused, I see that as a very sacred moment. Because again, it's opening, it's like opening up your chest and exposing all of this stuff. And again, you didn't choose it. Oh, so many of us grew up in it. I didn't choose it. So, but it's this huge revealing moment where (gasps) suddenly there's this pain and this release at the same time of, 
I didn't do it. it. You know, it wasn't something wrong with me. And that moment of it was a cult or this was abuse is so pivotal in, in your life. And, but that's the scary moment because then we can choose. And that, again, that's why healing matters because, and I look even in the people who still identify as Christian today, but who are walking away from these mo- these movements, what we grew up in, if you don't stop long enough to heal, you're going to repeat the exact same unhealthy patterns. So it feels like I'm doing nothing. I'm doing nothing. I'm doing nothing. It's been five years. I'm doing nothing. But you are because you're not, you're, you're breaking those cycles. You're breaking those patterns. And so once you've had that opening of the chest, this was abuse moment. Now you can begin that awareness, which leads to the healing, which leads to not repeating these patterns in in your family and your community. If you're still a practicing a faith in your faith communities, we have found a group of people we really enjoy that we go to church. Guess what though? We don't show up a Sunday. No one's calling us to see where we were. So that there's some freedom. Where are there. you? I know. It's like, yeah. what? I don't have to go every Sunday? <laughs> it's amazing. But women's Bible study in a church setting. I, I, I did <laughs> it. Laughing. Okay. So when our girls were so when our girls were young, I joined like a mops group, right? Where like moms, what yep, does that yep. stand for? Moms of preschoolers. Mothers of preschoolers. Okay, yeah. So I joined one of those because I had friends that were in it. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. It was mm-hmm. okay, but I got I, I had a very hard time with it. And yes, part of it, just personal reasons. And part of it, definitely background abuse, spiritual abuse reasons. Now the church we go to now love, we are, um, we're definitely raising our kids differently. They have the choice to go to church. I don't ever, I'll never force them to go. They, Mm -hmm. they're on their own journey. Like I'm okay with it. I am never going to put that on my kids. But think but, about the women's group thing again, because yeah. we both were having reactions to you saying yes. women's group. Okay. I'm remembering trying to join one when my daughter was tiny. I couldn't fit in. I think I even wrote a blog piece about it at the time. I probably took it down, but I didn't fit in. And I was like, part of it's because my, I mean, I traveled the world when I was young with Bill Gothard's organization. I'd seen things. I'd gone places. I'd led groups of 600 children at a time when I was 16 years old. Like there was all these lived experiences that I had. that I couldn't relate to the women. There was no way I could relate. And then they would sit around and whine and complain. And my husband never helps. And so there was no edification. And so, but now looking back, you mentioned, yes, the spiritual abuse to this. But I think, too, it's the mental health aspect. Yes. There is no support for moms. There's Mm -hmm. no true support. It's just we all come together. We get an hour of free babysitting. We drink coffee, listen to a lady talk for 20 minutes, and then we whine and complain because we're so stressed. We're so overwhelmed and nobody's Mm -hmm. helping us. Mm -hmm. You know what else? Yeah, go go for it. No, no, no. no, Please go. Go. I want to hear your perspective. No, that just brought something to mind for me when you were talking that I'd never considered. And so I'm just processing it. But I think when I, when you were saying why and complaining, that is one of the biggest things that I'm like, why? Like, is this just a complain fest? But I, when you said that about the abuse, I'm wondering Mm -hmm. because of my background we weren't allowed to whine and complain. Nope. You had to never suck it up, said, buttercup. you never said, I'm upset that my husband didn't take the trash out. You never would complain. So maybe these women were not raised the way we were and have the freedom to know that this other group of women won't judge them on fussing about the husband mm-hmm. taking the trash out. Or and I just can't connect with, with that because I'm still so much of the like you're fine just hold it in you're fine get over Mm -hmm. it wait till you have therapy you're fine so maybe i'm not saying i still want to go join thing but maybe that they do have more freedom in feeling like hey these women have my back and this is my moment and it i don't know but i think for me being you know coming from my background i have to be the one that chooses i tried that Okay, met some nice people. 
it wasn't for me. And I think it, it, and again, I think back when I was doing mops years and years ago, I wasn't at that mentally um, sound space where I could make a choice like that, where now I'm like, I can still participate in different aspects of this church. This part of it doesn't work for me. And I like that you're saying it that way too, because I always thought there was something broken with me that I couldn't fit into whether it was a secular or a religious mom's group. There's something so wrong with me, but I like how you're saying that. It's like, it's just not working for me right now. This is just not what I need right now. And that's part of, of the growth of the awareness about myself. But then it's, it's tearing down some of that old stuff where probably like me, you were taught you had to sacrifice for everyone. You had to serve everyone. And then that's why we were never allowed to ask for things for ourselves. Self-care was a dirty, evil, worldly word. And so even recognizing this is not a space that is constructive for me, that was something I couldn't do back as a new mom. I just thought I was broken and so messed up that, um, yeah, I was the problem. And it just made it worse. Like I know for me, when I was going to mops, I would leave, everyone's leaving encouraged and happy. And I was leaving depressed, like, ugh, yes. you know, like I didn't get anything yeah. from that. And I, and I tried really hard again, like probably you, yeah. I, I don't remember thinking, but I probably was thinking, oh, what's wrong with me? Why am I not having a good time here? Everyone else is doing great. Yeah. I so, can't make friends either. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I know. It's so, now I love it when I meet people. <laughs> We just met uh, last year. We're really good friends with them now. And I work for them, actually. But um, this new couple that we didn't know anything about. And we were at a work thing. And then afterwards, like, you want to go to dinner? So we had our kids. We're like, yeah, let's go. Mm -hmm. And so we sit down at the table. Never had talked seriously with these people. And they're just like, so how did you guys like meet? And we're like, well, we well. met when we were in the cult. And we got married in the cult. And they're like, so now it's hilarious. But I love telling people. And now, and one of the love, I, you know, it's a very pride thing. I, I love hearing people are like, how did you turn out so normal? That's awesome. And I'm like, That's no, I not a pride thing. That's not a pride thing. See, I had a friend of mine recently. I told her if I say this, I sound so prideful. And she's like, shut up, Rebecca. I'm more know. prideful. I will tell you. Thankfully, she's old enough to be my mother. And oh, so she good. can do those things. So, but we've been taught it's pride. It's not pride. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You're yeah. Right. But yeah, no. but I love hearing that. I'm like, oh, I'm glad that someone thinks I'm halfway normal. Uh, <laughs> but it takes a lot of work, you know, it takes it a lot does. of work and it's not, it's not an easy road. I feel like I say this all the time, but I do feel like so many people, um, you know, go through their journey so differently, whether they get mm -hmm. therapeutic help, whatever it is they do, it's different. And my thing is, I just like you were talking about the different levels of stuck. I've never really heard that that way. And I that was I, thank you for sharing well, that because I feel like, yes, and that's and you get I think, overwhelmed. I can't do anymore. I can't yes. do anymore. And I used to tell my husband so often, it's like, OK, I know the whole box concept, like put me back in the box. But I felt more like I was this like wild stallion inside like a pen in the middle of like Montana or Wyoming. And the doors, the gates open. And I can see the gorgeous mountains and I can see, but I'm like, all right, I took a couple steps out. Now I'm going to go back in. Now I'm going to go two or three steps farther. That's it. But I never actually get up to the mountain all the way to see the views to see the entire vastness of freedom that's available to me because it's so much work. It's so hard. And then you have all the layers of fear and all the, the what ifs and the, all the mindset from the mind control. But yeah. Mm. It, is, it, 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 and that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. And I have like, I'll go through phases now, even doing exactly what you just said, where I'm just like, Oh, it's too much. Like, and, and I think we have to be self-aware to where we know when we need a break from certain things. But mm -hmm. I go through moments where I'm just like, I, I'm not in, I'm not in a journal right now. I'm not going to do anything right now. Like, I just need to do nothing. Just like get through the week yeah. and do nothing. And so I think being aware of kind of where we are, and that's been a process too for me mentally, is getting to a place where I am healthy enough to be aware, and not like it happens all the time, but 
of what I'm needing when I need some breaks from things um, because it's it's a, like I yeah. took a year off of almost a year off of the podcast completely because of a depressive episode I was having. And it was just like, I, you know, I, I'm not accountable yeah. to anyone. It's my podcast and I need to do what I need nope. to do. And I had to take yeah. a break. And it's, I, and I missed that is it. healing I it. because you yeah. recognize it. Yeah. But you yeah. recognize what you needed and yeah. you took action and you did it. So that is healing because I wouldn't have done that when I was 20 years old. I would have kept sacrificing and suffering and doing for others or the expectations, all, all this level, this level of perfectionism that we've been handed yes. and also the level of um, imposter syndrome Yeah, oh. because we were like, I was taught to always deflect the glory, deflect the praise. So if I played a piano special or sang at church, I had to, oh, I had such a wonderful coach and my teacher was amazing. My parents really made me practice. Thank you for the compliment. I could never receive it because that pride thing. And so now as an adult, I feel like I'm nothing. Like who am I to even be on the Shaney Pants podcast? Like who am I? Like I don't. And so because we were handed, like imposter syndrome was wired into our DNA because we had we could never accept that praise and that glory. It all went to God or to our authority. Instead of saying, no, I have skills and abilities or I have worked hard or I need this or I want that. There's nothing wrong with that. It just feels so opposite. It feels so wrong. As you're saying that, I'm just like, mm, because it's so even like, I, I mean, I think I, probably. Me. I, yeah. I'm the problem. No. No, she's reading my journal again. Uh, no, I promise. But it's. It's so, it's so true. And I think, okay, I've been out 12 years and that's still a huge thing I deal with. And I oh, yeah. like the last several years been pretty, um, you know, online a lot on social media a lot. And so I'll get a lot of compliments. It is still the hardest thing for me to just respond. Thank you. Like yeah. I have to be like, Oh, you're so sweet. Literally, I'll say, you're so sweet. That's so kind of you to say thank you. Like, I can't just say thank you. I have to give because them a think compliment they mean back. It. Right. Because I'm like, eh, it's not yeah. that funny. It wasn't that good. Like, eh. And Actually, it's... it was, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Look at me. Look at me just saying thank you. I'm all by myself. Perfect. I'm so proud of you. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, thank you again. <laughs> but it's awful. And it's like, here I am. I'm 42 years old and I can't just accept a compliment. Like I literally. I think they cannot. honestly are giving you one because right. they mean it. I know yeah. it's it. But you're right. It's in the DNA. Like it is so a part of our life. And like the judgmentalness. That's one of the biggest things mm. when I got out. I'm like, I'm over being judgy because and we had different levels. I felt like there's still people that we're friends with now that have gotten out as well that I can't stand being around just because of how judgmental they still are. Um, yeah. and, but that's one thing it's in here still like, but it's getting it. better. <laughs> you don't say yeah. it. And, and I was never one probably to say it that much anyway, but I feel like, okay, 12 years out. I, it's still in there. Like it's definitely getting better. It's getting I'm at easier. the post office like last year. And I see this guy, like his pants are hanging down with his boxers hanging out. He's got, I don't know, like you just look at this like rock or punk, whatever, dude. And I sit in there and I'm like judging this guy. Oh my word. Pull your pants up. Where is your mama? Like, oh my word, you, who, like, then the next thing he, he's already out of the post office. He happened to see an old lady coming up the sidewalk. He goes and he waits for three minutes holding the door open. Oh my gosh. So this lady, and I'm like, okay, I just learned a lesson. Uh, huh? Why uh, am I still judging this dude by his appearance? I know better right. than that. Right. Why am I doing this? This is not right. Like he's just expressing his own inner feelings and his own creativities and his own. Why am I judging this boy? Boys. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, kind of what you're doing now I know we briefly have touched mm -hmm. on it what you're doing now books you have available and where um people can find you yeah yeah so I'm kind of doing lots of things right now um I have my job and then I have my other job and then <laughs> isn't that what we all do anymore yeah all no, the things uh, all the things 
So this year, um, I was a co-author on a paper on religious trauma. It was released by the Global Center for Religious Research. And it helped us show that um, there's a lot of people in the United States right now that are struggling with religious Mm -hmm. trauma. And religious trauma can come from your home environment. Um, It can come from a ministry. It could come from your Mm -hmm. church. So there's many places where we can have experienced an abusive power and control dynamic that's led to this form of trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was part of that research, uh, writing that paper. And then I'm doing speaking. I'm speaking at a couple different e-conferences coming up. Um, One of them actually talk about tending the wounds of religious trauma. Um, That one's coming up in December 9th. But um, I'm still continuing to blog. I'm doing that. I'm doing my other work. I'm doing some uh, research with the DNA side of my work, uh, the identity trauma with uh, DNA discoveries, doing some research with McGill University up in Canada. And um, I just kind of have a bunch of irons in the fire. But yes, I do have one book out right now. There's a couple more in the works. But um, that one book is called When Family Hurts. And we touched on that a little bit in our conversation about how relationships, even though we've healed and we've moved forward, it's kind of one of those scars that's always there. And so I wrote the book. It sounds so cliche, but I wrote the book I needed that I couldn't find. And there was a situation where decisions had to be made quickly. But there's not enough time to go to therapy session after therapy session. It would have cost me like 10 grand in a month to get all the therapy that I needed. And so I wrote this book as a 30 day self coaching guide for healing and clarity. And it was, it's just, it's a simple book, but it was questions that to ask yourself to help you understand you, what you need, why you need it, the boundaries you might need to put in place, the things you need going forward. And it's if there's, you know, anything in a, in a family relationship, um, pa- part of the work I do with the nonprofit, um, with the DNA surprises when you take an at-home DNA test. Um, Surprise, your dad's not your dad. That's what people are finding out all over the world. And so there was this crossover um, with families and being feeling betrayed by family, feeling hurt by family, being hurt or abused by family. And so this book kind of felt like it would meet some for both groups of people Mm. that I'm working with right now. And, um, so yeah, I wrote that book. So in 30 days, I hope that when you go through the book that you will have better clarity at what Mm. you need to go forward. Um, and so there's little journaling sections. You can just read it. You don't have to journal. I'm not a journaler, but, um, yet I'll say that yet perhaps someday, but it's just one of those that ask you the questions to really get you to think about what you need, who you are, what you want, where you're going in whatever situation you find yourself in with your family. And so you can find me on Twitter slash X. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. And then my website is my name, Rebecca And so, yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of taking opportunities as they come and we shall see where we go next. It's leads. exciting. It is. It's so exciting. And I'll definitely put all your handles and uh information on your book okay. in the show notes so everyone can thank find you. all the information there thank you but i uh i just i really appreciate you spending time with me today oh, yeah. i have been looking forward to this conversation and i just learned so much about you <laughs> so i feel like we just oh, no. kind of got started we did i know we need like a follow-up to the follow-up yes. To the- <laughs> yes i i seriously feel like next season is just going to be like and we're going to follow up with everyone else because i want to talk to them again so that well, that's fun. awesome. Yeah. I don't know. I, why not? Why not? So that would be great. But I really appreciate all that you're doing and yeah. sharing your wisdom here with us today. Ugh. And well, you know, wisdom comes from experience and not all experience is positive. Right. So, so ch- but that's, that's use it. <laughs> exactly. That's what yeah. I was going to say. We got it. And that's take the good, take the ugly and let's do something to help other people with it. And create healthy spaces for our children or for the next generation coming behind us. So if they if they do choose to go into religious communities, whether it's a church or friends or whatever, that they're healthy, that they're safe, that they have the tools that they need to recognize this is controlling or this is abusive. 
or this is a safe place where I can ask questions or be different or have different beliefs. Um, and I've always raised my daughter with the, is it wrong or is it different? Mm, I like that. And so if it's different, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Now wrong crosses boundaries. Well, are we lying? Are we controlling somebody mm-hmm. else? Are you, you know, being manipulative so you get your own way? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. There's definitely still right and wrong, but right. is this situation or this person wrong or just different? Mm, I like that. Well, and I, I, you know, as we're ending, I, I think <laughs> and like, keep going. Yeah. here we go. We'll turn it into a two, uh, it two episode session. But I, I feel like what you said is very important there. And that's something with my kids that I really am trying to do a lot differently than how we were raised is mm-hmm. we talk about everything. And yeah. like what you, when you mentioned boundaries and stuff, whatever group, whether it's school, church, you know, the kids are in sports, whatever. I don't care what group it is. Like there are things that are not okay. There are things Mm -hmm. where you tell me immediately. So like being um, that open with our kids in our home, I feel like is so important because they're going to get involved with something along the line, whether you're going to church or wherever Mm -hmm. you go, yoga, whatever you do. They're going to mm-hmm. get involved at some point in something where they're going to need all this information. So I, their gut is going to tell them something's off. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's, but very... it's so important to have those conversations with our kids. And also just because you and I were grew up under authoritarian control. We grew up with our parents of like, they must be perfect. And we never questioned them. And we're not allowed to, at least I wasn't allowed to ask about their past. I wasn't allowed to, you know, all of these things. So if you and I are just upfront about who we are and our struggles and, and the things that we're learning to me, it's like, that just makes you so much more real to your children and, and lowers their, I have to be perfect. And then when those times do come along, when they have to say, okay, um, mom, this person at school uh, did or said this, and I think I need to talk to you about it you already have that safe place going where you have been vulnerable with your children. You've actually said, mommy was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? You know, you, yeah, every day pretty much. Um, yeah. But it's that new pattern that we're, we're breaking the old cycles and being a cycle breaker, excuse me, but being a cycle breaker sucks. (laughs) It's like, it's so hard because yeah and then when you have when you're married you have the two of you coming together and you're both breaking generational patterns and cycles and it's like what are we doing but your life's work is breaking those patterns um and it's so important for our children to watch us doing that to understand why we're doing that and they get to be part of us establishing the new healthy boundaries, the new healthy ways of managing conflict, the new healthy ways of interacting with people and viewing and how we view people. And we can become that safe space for our neighborhood, for the school, for the sports teams. Our family can be the safe space. Right. The ones who bring peace to the world. Yes. And are accepting of all. And yeah, there, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things that, yeah, I've been trying to, impart wisdom upon my children where it is just more uh, yeah definitely not perfectionism going on over here that's for yeah. sure we have a while lot. mommy still wants to be a perfectionist i'm telling you you don't have to be although right. i really don't like that outfit and i think you look silly but you know what you get to wear it every day because you have... oh my gosh it's <laughs> yeah. just like ah, don't say anything don't some say of that anything. is just momming but some of it's also for example, I will give you a quick example. We, My daughter was like maybe three or four, I don't remember. And this guy hit us. It wasn't a super huge wreck, but boop, somebody, but we had had Taco Bell in the car. And so she has, whatever she was eating goes all over her clothes. She's in her car seat, goes all over her clothes. And do you know what the first thing I did after I made sure my husband and my child were safe because I wasn't driving? The first thing I did was I started cleaning up the Taco Bell in my car. And then I pulled out the clean clothes out of her diaper bag and put clean clothes on because I didn't want the police officer to see my child with food all over her clothing. That is the programming I'm talking about. 
that is the perfectionism. And I was like, I wanted to stick that bow back in her hair too, but she wouldn't let me at the time. Before the officer gets there, clean up my car, clean up my child. Not, we were just in an accident. Okay, we're all good. So those are the things that you and I have been deconstructing, have been rebuilding, have been telling our children, I don't care if there's taco juice all over your shirt. Right. You were just in an accident. Just sit still and take deep breaths and make right. sure you're safe and healthy. Right, right. Yeah, that sounds all too familiar because, yeah, yeah it's, and it's, it is an adult. It's, con it, you know, we're constantly, or I'm constantly in my brain, like doing like you're, it's always there. And so it's like yeah. always, it's work. And again, that's where it's work. It's work to be in recovery. It's work to be healing. And I think yeah. that's why a lot of people don't do it because it is a lot of work. It's but the pendulum worth swing. It. I know. Like I knew a family who dressed you know, very, they had the dresses with the high necks and their arms were covered and they wore the head coverings. And in a week's time, they were at the beach in bikinis. And while, yeah, they have the freedom to do that, it was really, really, really fast. So that's the pendulum. But then I've also known people who go, oh my goodness, this was all wrong. Boom. I'm no longer a Christian. I hate, I hate faith-based anything. I hate God, which again, you have the freedom to go there, but that's really, really fast. And so that's the pendulum, that's the healing part has to happen. And then what, if you are coming from a place of healing, of awareness, of understanding all the whole picture, that's all, you know, those cameras where you stand in the middle and then the camera like swirls all the way around you now. So that's what healing is. You're here in the middle, but you understand everything that's going on around you and why it's impacting you or someone else or why people made those choices. Then you make the decision to wear the bikini at the beach, or then you decide I'm no longer going to be a person of has any faith. I'm an atheist or I'm a what? So instead of just choosing these quick reactionary things, take the time to heal first and say, I don't know right now, but I'm healing. Oh, that's right. Forever. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Now we're for sure really ending. So thank Are you. Are we done? We're done. We're okay. Done. I mean, we're not, we're not even close to done, um, but we're ending this one. Uh, okay, I perfect. Really appreciate you being here. And uh, we'll definitely have to do this again. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of the Shanty Pant Show. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me every week. You can find all of my links to all my social medias, anything your heart desires at shantypantshow.com. You can even find my amazing merch is back up and running there. And you can email me from there. All the things. All the things. Also, you always ask, how can you help me out with this whole podcast situation? You can subscribe to my podcast. You can leave reviews. You can share it with friends. I appreciate it all. So I am super excited to bring you guys the rest of the season. It's going to be amazing. And I'll see you next week.